How many of you have ever doubted? Need I remind you, you're in church. (laughs) And if you're a parent, I know you need to be raising your hand because you've wondered if you're going to be the right kind of parent or if you're going to do this right, right? It's appropriate today on Father's Day. Will I be a good father? Don't answer that question, children. I see head shaking already. Am I really ready to have kids? And even after you have them, you still wonder if you're doing everything right. You know, I was talking yesterday with Karis about something, and I don't remember what it was, but she brought to my mind an old comedy routine. I remember it. It was, um, you know, fathers, you have two dreams or two images of your children as they get older in life, and the first one is they're standing up in front of people at a microphone dressed really nice, and they say, I'd like to thank the Nobel Academy. (laughs) And the other vision and dream you have of your child is them saying, would you like fries with that? (laughs) You know, you wonder when you do these kind of things, am I going to be good enough to do this? Would my children be better off if they had someone else as their parent? And my children would probably say yes sometimes. But let me assure you, fathers and mothers alike, God did not get anything wrong, just like I told the children up here. God blessed you and your children by putting the two of you together. And it's the most wonderful thing that ever could have happened. (laughs) Even when they do that. (laughs) So who doubts? Right? We all doubt from time to time. And that is the major issue I have with this text. I love this text, the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28. Right? Go therefore, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've taught you, and remember I'm with you always until the end of the age. And the reason we get this this morning on Holy Trinity Sunday is because this is one of the very few places in all of the Bible that it mentions the Holy Trinity. So they have to use this text on Holy Trinity Sunday to get the Trinity into the sermon. So we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you know what? That's the mention. That's it for the Holy Trinity right here. We want to talk about the Holy Trinity. We'll talk about it after worship. So come and find me. But verse 17 of this passage says that they gathered with Jesus on the mountain and they worshipped Him. And our reading says, and some doubted. In the original text, the word for some does not exist not there. English translations render this verse as when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That word for some is not there in the Greek text. And the word that's used for but in Greek can also mean and. So, this verse could be read, and seeing him, they worshipped and doubted. Now, that's not possible, is it? To be able to worship and to doubt at the same time? Those who worshipped Jesus also doubted Him. It's nothing more than what we believe as Lutherans, right? We are simultaneously... Thank you. Saint and sinner. We are both and. We are justified and we are not justified. It's like the divine and human natures of Jesus. Jesus is both human and divine. It's like later on when we come to this table, we, you will get a wafer, piece of bread. But it's not just bread, it's Jesus' body. And you'll get some wine, but it's not just wine, it's also Jesus' blood. It's both and. In the Lutheran church and in many denominations, we talk about the dichotomy of life and how things are two what seem to be opposite things at one time. Right? It's hard to understand, but can we worship and doubt at the same time? Mark Allen Powell, who is a New Testament professor at Trinity Seminary in Columbus, Ohio, writes in one of his books called Loving Jesus, he writes, I want to note that the word some is not actually found in the Greek Bible. Why is it in the English version? Well, Matthew uses a particular construction here that allows translators to think that the word some could be implied. He also uses that construction in 17 other instances. 
Though no one ever seems to think that the word is implied in those other 17 cases. It could be implied here, but why would it? I asked a Bible translator that question one time and got the following response. The verse wouldn't make sense otherwise. No one can worship and doubt at the same time. I invited this fellow to visit a Lutheran church because we do it all the time. Right? Seventeen other times Matthew uses the exact same grammatical construction that he uses here, but none of those other times does any translator ever think to use the word some in that, even though it's not there. Because who could worship and doubt at the same time? Powell continues a couple pages later, I think that worship is the essence of spirituality, but worship can sometimes be superficial. In Matthew 15, Jesus tells the Pharisees that they worship God with their lips while their hearts are far from God. The Pharisees, of course, are often the fall guys in this gospel, and they seem to stay in trouble the whole time. Still, say what you will about the Pharisees, one thing they never do is doubt. They are always certain about everything. They are the God said it, I believe it, that settles it people of the Bible. It never occurs to them that they might have overlooked something or misunderstood something as a result. They are often wrong, but they are never in doubt. By contrast, disciples of Jesus worship in doubt at the same time, and Jesus doesn't call their worship superficial. It might be going too far to say that doubt is a good thing, but I do note that Jesus never rebukes anyone for it. I am tempted to believe that just as fear seasons joy, so doubt seasons worship. Joy without fear becomes shallow, and worship without doubt can be self-assured and superficial. Fear and doubt are not good things in themselves, but they do keep us grounded in reality. So what does it mean to doubt? The word here for doubt in the Greek, dystazo, is a verbal form of dis plus something else. And dis in, dis in Greek is not like dis in the English, and I'm not going to dish you. Dis in Greek means to. Right? It's not disbelieving. Is, is that the spirit moving? Um, it's not disbelieving. It's not apisto, which is the word that Jesus uses in the Gospel of John when he talks to Thomas, right? Remember when he visited the disciples in the upper room and he came to Thomas and he said, in our, in our readings it says, don't doubt but believe. It's actually don't be unbelieving but be believing. It's not that word. It's not so much as It's not so much as disbelieving as it is between wavering between two possibilities. Right? Dis is two. So you are two-minded or having second thoughts on something. How many of you ever have ever had second thoughts about something? Right? That's what doubting is in our text today. It's only other occurrence in the New Testament. This word is in Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. Jesus is walking on the water to the disciples in the boat as they're crossing the sea. He's walking on the water out to them. And what happens? Peter says, Jesus, if it's you, call me out to you. And Peter, Jesus says, come on. Peter steps out of the boat and starts to walk to Jesus. And then what happens? He realizes what he's doing. And he starts to think. And after Jesus saves, Jesus After Jesus saves Peter from sinking in the water, he criticizes him. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you dis-waver? Why did you go between the two options that you knew were absolutely true? Because yes, we know. Peter knows that it's possible for him and Jesus to walk on the water. How does he know that? Because he was already doing it, right? He stepped out of the boat and he was walking on the water. So he knows that it's possible because he just saw it. He just did it himself. But Peter also knows the strong possibility that people, especially people called the rock, are going to sink when they step into water. Right? When humans step into water, what happens if it's deep enough? If you step off of a boat into a 15 foot, 15 feet of water, what's going to happen? You're you're going to go to the bottom. Some of us a lot quicker than others. Bunch, you're going to sink to the bottom, right? And when he gets out on the water, he wavers. He's looking at Jesus, but he's thinking, wait a minute, I'm walking on the water. I'm supposed to be sinking. So he starts to sink. And after they get all get into the boat, the wind stops, the storm stops, everything just chills out. And then verse 14, chapter 14, verse 33 states, 
And those in the boat worship those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Peter doubted. And they worshipped him in the boat. And you know what? The word for worship in the fourteenth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew is the exact same word that's used for worship in the twenty eighth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew when they're on the mountain. They worshipped in the boat and they doubted. They worshipped him on the mountain and they doubted. Two times in the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples doubt Jesus while they are worshiping him. Eugene Boring wrote about this same verse. Whatever the nature of the resurrection event, it did not generate perfect faith even in those who experienced it firsthand. It is not to angels or perfect believers, but to the worshiping, wavering community of disciples to whom the world's mission is entrusted. Let me say that again. Whatever the nature of the resurrection event, it did not generate perfect faith even in those who experienced it firsthand. The eleven on the mountain doubted. It's not to angels or perfect believers, but to the worshiping, wavering community of disciples whom the world's mission is entrusted. So who is sent? We all doubt. We've already established that. But who is sent? Jesus gave the great commission on that mountain to all of the believers who were listening. That's the eleven disciples and whoever else might have been there. And that also includes you. Right? Jesus gave the great commission to all of them. To those who were worshiping Him and to those that were doubting what they were seeing. And to those who were both. Those who are simultaneously saint and sinner. And all of us are commissioned and sent out into the world. Even if we don't fully comprehend what's happening here today, even if we doubt sometimes what it is that God is doing in our lives, even if we don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity, and even if we don't fully understand what happens each week when we come up here to this table, God still loves you and uses you as you are, commissions you and sends you out into the world. You could get the kids up here to sing. I believe that Peter Ide actually says this best, and if you've never heard this song, ask Carrie or me or one of the youth, we can probably get you a copy of it. Peter Ide is a Lutheran musician who has a song called As Is, and it talks about all of the people in the Bible who we see as heroes, but tells us everything about them that is completely wrong, right? Moses went and talked to Pharaoh, and what was Moses' problem? He stuttered. He had a speech impediment. He couldn't speak clearly. David was a murderer. Noah was a drunk. Paul had problems that we don't even know what they were. And these are all the pillars of our faith that we lift up and want to be like. But each one of them had a problem, but God still used them. The chorus of the song is, as is, as is. He chooses you as his, as his, as his, infuses you as is. Never ending, love transcending all of our weaknesses. No excuses, he uses us as is. So is it okay to worship and doubt? Absolutely. Is it okay to not understand everything that God is doing in your life all the time? Yes. Because you know what? I don't. And if you do, please come and help me. Because I don't get it all the time. And that's not what it's about. It's about the fact that we know that God loves us and uses us exactly as we are cracked pots, every last one of us. But God can use that for what He needs to use us for. So know that God sends you as you are and He is always with you. And even if the disciples wavered, right? Those 11 guys standing up there on that mountain, they doubted Jesus. So who do we think we are to think we could actually have this all together? Jesus is there with you, sending you out into the world to baptize, to name, to claim, to teach, to show people exactly how much they're loved, just exactly as they are, by a God who created them and loves them more than they could love themselves. So just trust Jesus and go and make disciples sharing the love and the mercy that He gave to you with all of the world 
around you each day. Amen.